to follow you. It is the cry of my heart to be close to you. It is the cry of my heart to follow all of the days of my life. Teach me your holy ways, O oh Lord, so I can walk in your truth. If I could have the young kids come forward for a couple of moments and have a seat on the floor. Good morning. It's good to see all of you today. So, what I'm going to do is want all three of you to stand up. And stand down here. Go down, go down here. And first test. Can you say your name? What's your name? You got that right. You're sure now. You're sure that's your name. Are they correct? You think so? Yeah. Now, the next part of the test is I've got a stick in my hand. Can you reach out and touch the stick? Ready? Go. You did. Very good. Okay. Let go. Now, the next part. Stand up straight and tall. Now, this is the last part. If you're as tall as this stick, you're on the winning team. Ready? Is he as tall as the stick? Almost. Is he as tall as the stick? No. Are you as tall as the stick? No. So none of you get to be on the winning team. Oh, that's very sad. We're going to learn today as we look at the message that God picked people that weren't good enough and made them winners anyway. He took a bunch of people like Moses and he blessed them in all kinds of ways and gave them that land of promise and he gave them eternal life. And so we're going to learn today that God doesn't pick only the best because there aren't any of us who are best. Now, Moses, what a story. It says in the text, and there has not risen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord God knew face to face. What a story. God chose me no, he didn't say, hey, Mo. But he said, Moses, I have a job for you. And I said, um, what? Who are you? What, 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 what? What do you mean? I think you've got the wrong Moses. I had a thousand reasons why it wouldn't be me because I, I, I can't do that. I use this stick because I'm a shepherd. I use it to keep the animals in line. I was, by the time that God called me and said, hey, Mo, I was already 80 years old. Anybody here 80 years old? I was the same age as these guys. Imagine. You're 80 years old, and God says, I want you to walk over to Egypt. You live somewhere else, not here. <laughs> I want you to walk over to Egypt, and I want you to go stand up in front of Pharaoh and say, hey, you've got several hundred thousand of God's people. Let them go. Yes, I know they're slaves. They're your servants. They keep your economy moving. But God says let them go, so let them go. 80-year-olds, you like that challenge? Wow. Uh, that's, uh, no. Maybe 
40 years ago. No, not even then. That's a big job. But God took me and, and he said, I've got this job for you. And it wasn't like he just called me into his office. Because I was in my office. I was out tending sheep. I was watching over the animals and, and I see this bush that's burning. How many have ever seen a bush that's burning? You live in Southern California, I guess. You've seen some of those. But this thing, as it burned, it didn't burn up. It just kept burning and burning and burning like, well, some kind of weird, deformed something. How does it not burn up? I've, I've burned trees before, burned bushes before, and well, they burn up. You've got to get more. But this one just kept on burning. And then I get this voice from the bush talking to me. And I'm thinking, man, I shouldn't have come up here today. I should have done anything different. My wife had some chores, and I said, well, I've got some sheep over in the North Hills I need to take care of. I should have skipped that. But here I am. And there's that burning bush. And God says, hey, Mo, I've got this job. And after our back and forth discussion, I finally agree. And so I go to Egypt and, and it works. I'm thinking, well, uh, I'm 80 years old. I've lived a good life. I'll be dead soon. But I go into Egypt and I talk to Pharaoh and he says, eventually, after God smacks him around a fair bit, he says, okay, get out of town. And so we leave. And I won't belabor you with all the details because we'd be here till, well, a long time. But one of the things that I want you to understand is, is that when God gave me those stone tablets, when he gave me those commandments that over the centuries have been referred to as the law of Moses, that was profound. That was a game changer, a life changer. First of all, the law of Moses, I didn't make those things up. They aren't the laws of Moses, they're the laws of God. God said, do this, don't do this. If they were the laws of Moses, I might have all kinds of other things. Like, don't whine, don't complain, don't bring your problems to me, figure it out, quit, quit being a whatever. But God said, here, here's what you tell them. And so I gave them the law of God. That began with, and here's the part that matters most in all of that, the law of God began with God saying, I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord your God. That's how he began. He's got this bunch of misfits. We're out in the wilderness. We're journeying to the land he's going to give us that he's promised to our to our ancestors. And he says, I have chosen you. And you know, I'm, I'm thinking, I've spent some time already with that band of misfits. And, and I'm thinking God could have done better. 
He could have chosen a different crowd. Let's say that, that this half, that you are all the people that, that left Egypt. Okay? That I get to lead as God leads me to the land of promise. And as I'm spending time with you, I'm thinking, thanks, God. I thought sheep were bad. So I'm, I'm thinking, God, why don't you just, or you should have just not picked that crowd. Maybe there would have been a better crowd over here. Maybe this bunch would have been less whatever I keep finding day after day. But then, you know, I'm just like them, too. I'm still flawed. I was whining and complaining too much, and I was not listening to God, and I was doing things the wrong way too often. But God still said to them, to me, I am the Lord your God. That's what he wants us to know. That you are his children. That he has chosen you. Chosen us. And after he does that, he says, now that I have made you my people, live this way. And he gave us the rest of the command. But it's the law of God. It's not the law of me. Although we would like it to be. Think about the Ten Commandments. Maybe you'd like to add an eleventh. How many have thought about that before? Adding one more. Because I think, I really wish God would have also said. Or I wish God wouldn't have put in that one. Because... I don't like what that one says because it means I can't do or shouldn't do or that I'm supposed to do, and I don't like that one. So maybe we could change things a little bit. But it's not the law of me. Even in our society, even in this day and time, it's not your law for you to change as you see fit. It's what God says. It's not for us to pick and choose what parts we like. It is what God says. And if we would look at the standard and say, well, God says this, like with those young kids, here's the standard. Unless you can be tall enough to meet the standard, you're a loser. In other words, if, unless you can keep the law of God perfectly. Perfectly. That means never, ever, ever sin. Imagine if God comes to you and says, okay, what's, what's your name, young lady? Tina. Tina. Imagine if God says to you, Tina, okay, I'll let you in if you have kept my law perfectly. Who's that gentleman over there? Do you know him? How do you know him? He's my friend. He's snickering. Does he have some inside information? So, so, are you saying, sir, that she's not perfect? <laughs> Don't want to sit too close to that interaction going to happen later on. Whoa. But imperfect you are. 
just like he is and just like she is and him and her and those two and all the rest yeah even you <laughs> she tries to even that one what's your name Susie, Susie. <laughs> even little pretend Susie over here is imperfect but God says I'm not just going to pick the good ones because none of us are the good ones. Starting with me. I'm not good enough. But God has covered me. God has said to me, okay, Moses, I am the Lord your God. I picked you. And I have made you holy. I have established with you this relationship where I am your God. You are my child, which means I am going to bless you, not just with land of promise, but with eternity. Because I am the Lord your God. And, and you read today about my death. That's kind of a weird thing to read about. Ever read about your death? How many here have read about your death after it happened? It's kind of weird when you read about my death. And Moses died and God buried him. But yeah. And people say, that's not fair. He spent 40 years dealing with those whining, complaining, grumbling. And then when they finally get to the land that he's going to give them, God says, no. Moses, you're not going in. Talk about unfair. But no, not at all. I, I didn't get to go into the land, to the earthly land of promise. I didn't get to spend the next decades dealing with those who already lived there that we had to kick out, or that God would kick out as we followed. I got to go, after 120 years of living, to heaven, to the land of promise. See, that piece of dirt is just a piece of dirt. The land of promise, the real land of promise, is the, the symbolism is just the ground, that nation of Israel. But the land that is their reward is God's eternal home. That's the land of promise. So I, I was not shortchanged a bit. I was blessed by being allowed to retire, if you will, at the young age of 120. <laughs> but then you also heard in the other reading, I got to come back. Not just today, that other time. With Peter and James and John and Jesus and Elijah, I got to come back. Peter, James, and John were kind of freaked out by the whole thing. They're still bewildered by what Jesus does and says. And he's up on the mountain only with those three now, not the whole group. And he's praying, and we show up. And he starts glowing, reminding me of that time when I encountered God face to face, and he, and, and he gives me his law and I come back down from the mountain glowing because I have been in the presence of God. To the point where the people of Israel said to me, Moses, cover your face. You're freaking us out. You've gotten too close to God. We can't handle that. So you need to back away a little bit. But Peter, James, and John got to see us. And hear God say, this is my son. Listen to him. Okay.
as they got that glimpse of the glory of Jesus. As they got that glimpse of the one who said to them, I am the Lord your God. If you read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and look at the disciples and their lives, how many of them did a really, really, really good job figuring out Jesus' mission and message? Of the twelve, zero. But God chose them, didn't he? Jesus chose them. I am the Lord your God. I have made you mine because I have made you mine. Not because you are good enough to be mine, but because I have chosen you. And so as we live our lives day by day, we are encouraged to remember our chosenness. As we are washed in the waters of holy baptism, as we are given God's Holy Spirit in our hearts, as we are made something that we can't be by ourselves, God's children. Repeat after me. I, I am God. the Lord, Lord. Your, God. your God. Say that again. I am One more time. Now, I want you to close your eyes for a minute and imagine that God's, gonna, God's saying that to you. Say it again. Ready? That's quite a sound with all these voices, but imagine the voice of God saying to you, I am the Lord your God. Picture him right in front of your face. Picture him right there, face to face, the glory of God, the majesty of God, the power of God, the grace of God, and you're saying, oh, I'm dead. <laughs> but he says, no. Susie, even though you're imperfect, I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord your God. He is the Lord your God. So now as you live your life from this day forward, remember that. Remember, you don't have to do all of these things to somehow make God think you're good enough because you're all going to come up short. No matter how close you are, you're coming up short. But as you rely on the grace of God, on the mercy of God, and even as you get to the point, like I did at 120, of your own death, don't worry about it. Don't worry about where you're going. And all of the what ifs or oops. But remember those words he said. I want you to change it a little bit. I want you to repeat after me now. He, he is, is the Lord, Lord my, God. my God. Close your eyes again. Stand up. And say those words. He is the Lord my God. Again. He is the Lord my God. And one more time with a loud voice. He, he is, is the Lord my God. my God. Amen. Amen. And remain standing as we speak the words that summarize the Lord our God in the Nicene Creed. As together we say, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father, the world. <clears throat> light of light, 
very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory, judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. 